and we're delighted to have Scott Lorch. So Scott, I've known Scott a long time, um, did um, part of his training at Northwestern and then um, came to Philadelphia to do his um, neonatology fellowship here at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And then he joined the faculty um, and rose really rapidly like a rocket ship um, through the ranks and is now a professor of pediatrics. And he's really one of the world's experts um, in this area of epidemiology. Um, and I think he has a lot of expertise and, and can really help us, I think, try to understand how studies are conducted, how well they're conducted, questions that we can ask. Um, and with his um, expertise, I think you'll really enjoy this talk. So Scott, it's your turn now. So thank you for this opportunity. I am on clinical service. I apologize, but I've cleared out the thing for the next hour or so. Um, so I'm gonna talk about, uh, Becky asked me to kind of talk about uh, some of the ways that I think about environmental epi research and um, some of the uh, challenges that such research has in the in the pediatric space. Um, no conflicts of interest uh, to sue. So, um, as I said, I'm not a epidemia. I'm not a specifically an environmental epidemiologist. I'm more of a health services researcher um, and health economist. My area of, of expertise. Um, is in um, focusing on differences in outcomes between children uh, with the primary areas, uh, looking at care quality, uh, drivers on the patient level, mostly around social, um, socioeconomic, economic, and uh, race ethnicity uh, factors, and then a, a growing body of work on the role of the organization of healthcare and the larger healthcare policies that we enact um, on. Uh, on explaining the differences in outcomes that we see of children. So one place where a lot of these topic areas start to intersect with environmental epi is a study that um, Dylan Small led, who is a professor of statistics at Wharton, who got interested in this idea of how surface mining may influence outcomes. And since he's done a tremendous amount of work in, um, in perinatal epi because he was worked with me for um, at least 15 years. Um, he asked the question of how surface mining may influence um, outcomes of pregnancy um, using birth certificate data to ask the question how residing in a county with a high surface mining proportion um, impacted the observed pregnancy outcomes of uh, patients in that uh, area. Um, for those who aren't as familiar, this is a surface mine. Um, essentially, unlike other types of mines, they blast off the top of a mountain using dynamite and other, um, other mechanisms and basically um, mine the entire top of an area, destroying whatever other um, surface vegetation or other um, features are in the, the way, so to speak. And so there's the argument is that surface mining produces tremendous air and groundwater pollution and leads to health challenges. But there is a set of papers that show negative health effects associated with surface mining and other studies failing to show effects and many times the same outcomes. And a, um, a systematic review literature in 2017 highlighted some of the potential problems in this literature. Um, and when I show kind of the, the key uh, uh, table in this in the next slide. So outcomes shown here on the left-hand side of the slide, the number of studies that were done. And I want you to look on the, the right-hand side, which is the risk of bias, because many of these outcomes that we see here um, that, in, that are studied um, have a number of other factors that may influence uh, the ultimate outcome of the patient. And this analysis measured, green being good, red being bad, the way that these studies accounted for confounding factors or factors that are associated with both living in an area with high surface mining areas, but that also may be associated with outcome, how well the exposure of surface mining was assessed, 
and then how well the outcome was measured in these, in these studies. I want you to point out that while um, the outcomes were relatively well um, assessed in these three groups of outcomes, cardiopulmonary, cancer, and reproductive outcomes, uh, we see that both the exposure and confounding have a fair amount of red and yellow in them, suggesting that these studies had not done a very well job, a very good job of controlling for these various factors. Um, we see similar things with mortality and general health status, with mortality being actually the worst um, set of studies with multiple studies, uh, in particular with the exposure um, being modestly okay or poor um, based on the ratings of these authors. So um, I, I use this to kind of drive into uh, what I wanna talk about today, which is to identify and understand how various factors that we study um, may influence the outcomes that you may be interested in looking at from a pediatric and perinatal perspective. And then to introduce, this is not a methods talk, so we're not gonna spend an hour on that, but introduce some methods to consider to help isolate the impact of environmental stimuli on the health outcomes of newborns and children. So what my research group studies is really po population health, which is the old, overall health outcomes of a group of individuals, um, including the distributions of such outcomes within groups or identifying subpopulations which have a better or worse set of outcomes than the general population. And the goals are really to optimize these outcomes across all patients within a given region, a given area, uh, whether that's a region, state, or across a nation. Um, the U.S. has um, a lot of data that suggests that they do poorly on a lot of perinatal and pediatric outcomes. I'm only gonna show two right now. This is a slide from Lancet in 2018, which presents the preterm birth rate um, in the United States, which I highlighted with the large um, yellow arrow uh, compared to other similar or what would be considered less developed countries across the world. Um, and this just shows that the US rates of preterm birth, which is defined as 36 weeks or under gestation at delivery, um, are poor compared to many of these other countries. Similarly, preterm birth rates vary by uh, state. Um, and this graph, uh, which is an older graph from 2020 from the March of Dimes, shows preterm birth rates where green uh, states have the lowest rates uh, of preterm pre 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 birth and red shows states with or territories with the highest rates. And we can see a fairly large variation between the states with the lowest rates, uh, which are predominantly in the Pacific Northwest and in Vermont and New Hampshire, and the states with the highest preterm birth rates, which are typically um, and consistently located in the uh, southeastern part of the United States. And I think what I like to point out is that there's a number of nested factors which uh, ultimately determine here pregnancy outcomes, but also outcomes of, patient, of pediatric patients and children, um, stemming from patient factors in the center of this uh, schematic, um, nested within community factors, such as the physical environment and economic opportunity and healthcare access, as well as national factors, which are typically surrounding economic, social, and healthcare policies. And it's really important to take into account not only these factors when you're doing a study, uh, an epidemiologic study as confounding factors, but also how they may interrelate uh, to lead to the outcome that you observe in a given um, a cohort of patients. Um, so as a schematic of this, we can imagine two sets of factors. Uh, one which may be on the y-axis and one may be on the x-axis. Ideally, what you like to see is that there's an optimal place to optimize the outcomes for both uh, factors, shown here on figure A. So whereby you, your goal is to get factor, the medical risk factors ideal, and let's say healthcare access ideal on the other axis. And there you'll have this nice top of the, the uh, an outcome where your goal is to be higher on this z-axis. But in reality, what we see with most studies and most uh, associations are that these factors don't interact consistently. That for a given set of, let's say, patient risk factors, there's an ideal of community factors which optimize 
but for another patient, those outcomes may be less optimal for the patient, thus giving a outcome landscape, which is a craggy kind of set of mountain, almost like a terrain of a mountain, rather than the nice hill that we see in the top portion of this panel. This is important because if one aspect of your analysis is some sort of environmental um, exposure, what we observe in the studies may be altered or modified by the remaining set of factors that go along with that exposure that we see in, in, in human patient-oriented research, which is very different than what Becky and others of you do that study these exposures in a more controlled laboratory setting. So I like to put this, uh, this uh, quote in. Um, this was a, a, a paper from Lancet, which argued that um, when we look at public health outcomes, that we need a wider set of approaches and a focus on the complexity of the systems that we see in healthcare um, to really optimize um, and develop effective responses to major public health challenges. We can apply similar types of ideas to an environmental um, epidemiological approach. So for this group, I wanna give a couple of examples of what I mean by other types of ALK of drivers of difference that, I'm sorry, other drivers for variations and outcomes that we see in pregnancy, some of our work from our groups. Um, and then we'll circle back around to how we should be thinking about those factors when we have here my example of surface mining, but could be any other environmental exposure that we're interested in studying at a population um, level. So the first we're gonna talk about community factors here, the role of structural racism and obstetric markets on the outcomes of pregnancies in the US. So as many of us know, living in a highly segregated neighborhood is a risk factor for many outcomes, um, including infant mortality, preterm birth and low birth weight. What those factors within the segregated neighborhood though are less certain. But some arguments have been that the pathways to changing health may be either in concentrating poverty, limiting opportunities for achievement, fostering poor neighborhood conditions, which could be environmental in nature, as long as other, um, other factors. And that many of these factors lead to a common pathway of inciting chronic stress, which then alters the ultimate outcome of, a, of an infant. We've seen that there's evidence of racial disparities in interventricular hemorrhage, which is a complication of premature birth. Uh, where there's bleeding uh, in the interventricular areas of the brain, which can have long, short and long-term uh, sequelae uh, for the infant, um, particularly around their neurodevelopment. Um, and that black infants have both increased incidence in several studies, as well as higher mortality related to IVH compared to non-Hispanic white infants. So one factor that uh, one of my mentees, who's now a third year uh, fellow with us, Daria Moresco was interested in, is how residential racial segregation is uh, associated with this. So this study, um, this graph actually comes from a website, which unfortunately is not in existence anymore. They took data from the census in 2010, and um, it's a special data from the census where they had the home address of every respondent, all 330 million US residents, and they placed them on a map. And then they color coded them by race ethnicity, where uh, non-Hispanic white in there were blue dots, non-Hispanic black uh, individuals were green dots, Asians were red and Hispanic, which were either white or black or Asian racial groups were um, represented as orange on these maps. And they show a very interesting phenomenon of where people live. And if you take these maps and overlay other environmental exposures, you can get some very interesting uh, pictures here. This is Philadelphia with the Schuylkill River on the, uh, as the white side on the left-hand side of the slide and the uh, Delaware River on the right-hand side of the slide. And you can observe some fairly significant clumping of color. The more clumped the color, the more segregated people are in their residence in this city. And you can see the appreciation of the West Philadelphia um, uh, uh, area around Penn, which is 
a, a more a, a gentrification occurred over the last 15 to 20 years. You can see Center City with its gentrification, but then large areas of both um, Hispanic and uh, non-Hispanic Black populations in North Philadelphia, Southwest Philadelphia, and, um, and the University City area. Philadelphia in 2010 was the sixth most segregated city in the United States, um, with, as shown on this measure, the higher the percentage, the higher the proportion of patients um, that are, that these colors clump together. You can kind of imagine that. Um, I will show two other examples. This is Detroit. Um, Eight Mile Road is the uh, county line, and you can see a distinct banding difference of color um, between people who live in Detroit proper, which is south of Eight Mile Road, and, and the suburban areas in Detroit, which are above. To show an example of a, a less segregated community, this is Sacramento. And what you can appreciate is these colors blur a lot more, and also there's a lot more orange befitting the fact that in California, a markedly higher proportion of the population is not as Hispanic compared to non-Hispanic white or black um, in these areas. So Dr. Moresco actually took data that we have, uh, which were population data from Pennsylvania, Missouri, and California over a 15-year period, which were all births in the state, and um, assigned basically a rate of segregation based on residential zip code to each of the births. And she, as we'll talk about later down the road, matched patients who had the same likelihood of living in a highly segregated area, um, but didn't to patients who had a similar likelihood of living in a segregated area who did. And we use patient and mostly patient factors, but some community factors um, to predict this likelihood of living in such a segregated area. She actually also did this by race. So she matched white um, patients who did not live in a highly segregated area to those who did, but who had the same likelihood of living in such a segregated area. So this is a method called propensity score matching, which helps us at least make the two groups look more similar in these measured factors that we have, such as education, um, age, maternal risk factors, such as hypertension and diabetes that we have in these data sets. And what she found was an interesting phenomenon that um, living overall in a highly segregated area increased the risk of having an interventricular hemorrhage in these premature infants by about 8% but that the effect was centered solely on the non-Hispanic black population who had about a 16% increased risk of IVH compared to white infants who also live in these segregated areas, but are the white blobs in, this, in those maps, whose risk of IVH was not statistically different than those non-Hispanic white individuals who lived in a less segregated area. So these data really suggest that there's something about the communities that these, in, these um, patients were having their experience in their pregnancies in that then translated to altering the risk of IVH in infants who are born prematurely from these pregnant women. So one interesting question is what are those drivers of segregation? And we have not measured, but could there be environmental factors that explain these observations? But as we we'll see later, it's important then to tease out the environment picture from these other factors that are associated with highly segregated areas and to test and measure explicitly for those differences. Ideally, finding patients who live in, let's say, a highly segregated area with a higher exposure to some um, your environmental exposure of interest versus those who have a lower exposure to whatever environmental uh, area of interest. And then understand how these additional factors may be similar or different and how they may, they may um, modify the result that you see as we see here, race ethnicity, which modify the association of, of, of living in a segregated area on the outcome of IVH. <laughs> 
So the second piece that I want to present is some of our work on hospitals and healthcare, which has actually been one of our interests um, in terms of asking the question how the healthcare system may alter one's association between an infant stimuli and uh, an adverse pregnancy outcome or an adverse infant outcome associated with pregnancy. Um, and we spend quite a bit of time thinking about how to optimize the healthcare system to um, ameliorate some of these um, adverse outcomes that may happen from, from, from you know, here in environmental stimuli or where people live or um, other patient or community factors. So what's important to realize compared to the adult um, healthcare system is that the pediatric system has fewer sites of care and they're actually dropping um, over the past 10 to 15 years and that children actually experience different types of care um, and reason for hospitalization compared to adults, um, typically having more acute versus chronic medical conditions. Although at a place like CHOP, there's a large proportion of patients that have chronic medical conditions, uh, similar to let's say adult hospitalization. And they have lower overall medical severity for their acute care but that the key drivers of cost and healthcare use are the sickest patients, such as those born prematurely or those infants who have complex medical conditions. So thinking about how to optimize the care that these children receive are critical to optimizing the outcomes of patients overall um, and children in the healthcare system. So for premature infants, what data um, from multiple studies, including work from my, my group, um, suggests that you have higher survival for infants who are born 32 weeks and under and 1500 grams at birth and under when they deliver at a hospital who has the resources to take care of them. And the lingo we use in our field is a level three or level four NICU, which is basically a hospital that can resuscitate and manage the baby as they are born. Um, and in honesty, I, I think I really look at the delivery of a premature infant similar to a, a trauma patient or a patient with acute injuries where there is a golden hour of time when you really start to establish the trajectory that that infant will go on to the you know to experience um, and their ultimate outcomes that they may experience six eight ten twelve twenty weeks down the road but interestingly work from our group has suggested that the outcomes and the effects of delivering at the here the right place differ by state. Uh, this graph shows um, state on the, um, on the Y axis for three different outcomes in hospital mortality, mortality within 28 days of delivery, and which is in the middle, and bronchopulmonary dysplasia or uh, lung disease secondary to being premature, which are shown on the, the bottom three um, um, figures. Odds ratios are shown on the X axis with the odds ratio for delivering at um, a level three or level four high volume NICU um, shown as the um, diamonds and the 95% confidence interval shown as the whiskers. So let's look up on the top um, margin right here, the in-hospital mortality group. We can see that for all three states, the uh, benefit, the effect of delivering at a high level hospital is to reduce the risk of mortality. But we can see that this risk ranges from about a 20% drop in California to an almost 70% drop in Pennsylvania, which is a very substantial difference um, between states. Similar differences were seen in neonatal mortality, as well as bronchopulmonary dysplasia, where Missouri had a very low rate of bronchopulmonary dysplasia for infants born at, the, um, at appropriate hospitals, compared to California, where the rate was actually not statistically different, but was um, above one, suggesting that there was a higher risk of BPD in patients delivered at a level three or level four hospital. So we can ask why. Um, and there can, are a lot of hypothesized areas, including variations in the quality of care these patients received, differential care within hospitals or between hospitals that um, patients of specific characteristics attend to, and how easy it is for patients to get to the right hospitals, which differ by region and by rural versus urban lo um, residential location. And there's a limited body of work. You're gonna see a lot of it because we have really focused on this part of, of this work um, to really answer some of these questions. 
So for quality, we see in structures of care, we've shown that the volume of the delivery hospital that you that a patient delivers at is associated with risk of death and comorbidity or death shown on this slide. So death is the top part of this panel, comorbidity of death is at the bottom and different thresholds, which are the number of infants here born um, at that hospital who have a gestational age of 31 weeks or less are shown as each, each line. Um, the risk of the outcome is shown as the, um, here's the relative risk and is shown as the dot with the 95% confidence interval shown as the whiskers. And we can appreciate that mortality risk is higher than the reference group, which is um, having a hundred or more infants of very preterm infants deliver at your hospital in a given year. The risk goes up starting here about 40, uh, 40 the threshold is around 40 or less, where you get an exponentially higher risk of death as these um, infants are delivered at these hospitals with smaller volumes. And when we combine comorbidities or death, we find that there is a higher risk starting at 90, and this risk also exponentially goes up as the volume of babies goes down. I point this out because many studies of environmental influences on pregnancy outcomes focus in on rural communities. Um, a lot of the studies in California, which look at air pollution in the Central Valley of California, fracking studies, which look at studies in rural Pennsylvania, and the healthcare and the healthcare access that these patients have is very different than what exists in large urban centers. Not saying that Philadelphia doesn't have its share of small volume hospitals as well. But this is, I think, an important covariate to consider when we're doing studies of risk and outcome um, from an environmental perspective. Equally as important is that there's variations um, within hospitals of the same ilk. Um, this is a study from, Cal from the Vermont Oxford Network, which is a, a, a consortium of over a thousand NICUs worldwide, about 750 NICUs in the United States, um, where they collect data on the outcomes of prematurely born infants at these hospitals. It, it encompasses now about 94% of all very low birth weight infants in the US. And they um, measure, they they actually assess, assign a measure of care quality based on a nine factor um, score called the baby monitor score. We'll see this again. Essentially above one, above zero is good, below zero is bad. These are weighted Z scores um, compared to what would be expected for a hospital um, given their case mix. Um, I show this data just to show that um, across the nine regions of the United States that they studied in this um, study from 2019, that the average weighted mean score for quality ranged from almost one standard deviation above expected, shown in the Pacific area down at the bottom, to almost um, 0.7 below expected in the mountain west area of the United States, suggesting that there's pretty substantial regional variation in the care quality um, received by premature infants in the United States. There's also variability of, of outcomes within um, hospitals of similar characteristics. This is data also from Vermont Oxford, which really looks at primarily level three NICUs who all have pretty much a similar um, set of resources available to manage and care for prematurely born infants. And what they show here is the 10th, 25th, 50th, 75th, and 90th percentile um, rate, risk adjusted rates of mortality on the, on the left hand side and bronchopulmonary dysplasia or chronic lung disease on the right hand side. And then year of birth is on the y axis from 2005 to 2014. What I want you guys to see is that these rates, not that mortality rates have on average gone down and the rates of EPD have stayed the same, which they have, but that the difference between the bottom gray line and the top gray line or 10th and 90th percentiles has stayed the same. Even as mortality rates have gone down, the variation has remained static across these hospitals, suggesting that these are pretty similar hospitals and yet there remains fairly significant variations in their outcomes that they have. 
And accounting for such variation is pretty important as we think about these differences in care. And we're gonna see why this may be an important piece for um, our surface mining study in about 15 minutes or so. Um, what is also interesting for patients, um, for patients of different characteristics is that they may experience these effects differently. And this is a study from uh, one of the CHOP residents who's now a neonatology fellow at Boston, who looked at the impact of delivering at the right hospital, a level three, a level four NICU for very low birth weight infants who were non-white compared to non-Hispanic white. And what she, what, what she was interested in seeing is, is the risk of mortality lower for non-white patients if they deliver where they're supposed to be. Well, what she found on these slides, which are showing these data here, is that for mortality, non-white and non-Hispanic white infants had the same benefit. But on this right-hand side of the slide, this composite morbidity effects, all the lines were less than one. That is, non-white patients had a bigger drop in their risk of more of a severe morbidity associated with preterm birth or death compared to white patients. And the reason that we've seen in, in more recent data is that the effect is secondary to worse outcomes experienced by non-white patients when they go to hospitals that can't take care of them, the low level, level one and level two hospitals. It's also suggestive that we see bigger effects in states that have worse quality and so it kind of goes hand in hand with this, that it does look like that patients, that minority non-white patients don't go to the same hospitals as not as non-Hispanic white patients, particularly when they're going to hospitals that are less capable of taking care of their, of their infant or their pregnancy. But there's also evidence that there's differential care between hospitals. Um, so this is a study from the profit group out at Stanford who looked at that same quality score, but looked at within hospital differences between um, the quality score for non-Hispanic white infants as the blue diamonds and non-Hispanic non black infants shown as the red squares. What is important to see here is that these dots don't line up next to each other there is the variation between patients within hospital and that it does vary. And the, the degree that these scores vary um, by the overall quality of the hospitals, which, are, which improve as you go to the right on this slide. But what I like to point out as is that it's not the case that non-Hispanic whites or the blue diamonds are getting better quality, which is reflected here as being on top of the line. Some hospitals where you see the red circles around the uh, red squares, that is the case. But there are numerous hospitals where non-Hispanic black patients actually get better care than non-Hispanic white patients. So it suggests that this is uh, that as for here, one set of factors, there is, there, is, there is evidence of differential care within a hospital, but we don't have a great story for how that care may differ or for whom may be getting better or worse care or why? This is a much more complicated question. But data that's just been actually published last week by Betsy Salazar, one of our third year fellows, um, shows something that was that's interesting um, that we didn't really expect to find until we looked at it, which was, do we see differences in care by level of hospital between the very extreme premature infants and those born not so premature. So those are less familiar. Risk of a poor outcome increases as the baby gets more premature from term, which is age gestation, all the way down to um, the extreme premature, which is what most of our studies look at, which are 24 or 23 weeks to 28 or 29 weeks. This study compared the quality of care received by those patients shown here on the top graph under the on bar A to the babies, I'm sorry, as bar B, to the babies who are born moderate preterm or 30 to 36 weeks, who are much more common, but who have less overall illness severity and generally have better outcomes than the extreme premature infants. These are bar and whisker graphs, so and, and are done by level, 
with the levels of care, which are different because Vaughn does it differently, going upwards from A to B to C, where A with restrictions on ventilation are the hospitals that are least capable of taking care of the most extreme premature infants and in general don't take care of babies under 32 weeks gestation at birth. To C, which are the CHOP level nurseries, which really have no restrictions on the patients that they can take care of and generally have pediatric subspecialty and surgical subspecialties available for consultation and management. Let's look at the B slide first. These are the quality of care that the very low birth weight babies or extremely preterm babies receive. And we can see that um, compared to the left-hand bars, the highly technolo technology, highest level care hospitals have a slightly better uh, quality score compared to them. It actually did not reach statistical significance, um, suggesting that the care quality that these sets of hospitals deliver to the patients is relatively the same. In contrast, the side up on here in the top left shows the quality scores for the moderate preterm infants. And what we see here is that there's a downward trend, which is not desired. That is that the level C hospitals had a lower quality score for these patients compared to the level A, less technology-based hospitals. And when you break it out by gestational age, shown on the bottom of the slide, we can see that it's starting at 32 weeks that this trend occurs. 30 to 31 weeks, that slide looks very similar to the very preterm babies. But the, for the 32 week infants and above, consistently the highest level hospitals had on average a worse quality score than the lower level hospitals. We don't know why. One hypothesis is that when you have really sick kid, when you have a lot of sick patients, you either ignore those, the less sick patients, or you don't develop either expertise from the nursing staff or from a protocol perspective to optimize those patients. There may be other reasons, this is ongoing work, but it is interesting that we see evidence of differential quality of care here by characteristic of gestational age. The final area for variation is access to care. Um, there is a highly complex model to determine why, whether hospitals that you should care for patients of, that have some sort of complexity are either available or are and consequently used by patients in a given area. For rural communities, many times availability is uh, lacking, but for other areas, there may be, for example, Philadelphia, um, highly qualified, high quality, highly successful hospitals that patients choose to bypass and attend less, qual less high quality um, hospitals and understanding why that happens and then its ultimate impact on patient outcomes is really important. So, um, so what I point out to everyone, and I'm gonna show some slides really quickly, is that maternity care is not uniformly available in the United States. The side on the left um, from Sarah Hanley, who's one of our faculty members here, um, shows um, the location of every hospital in the US um, and their volume of deliveries are shown um, from the lowest under 500 per year in the pink dots all the way to blue dots, which are more than 2000 a year. And what I want you guys to appreciate is that the dots aren't uniformly distributed. And it doesn't mean that only like rural communities that don't have um, hospitals, I point out Iowa and Minnesota have a lot of dots in them. Um, versus like Nevada, which has a very sparse amount of dots. Um, and that there also variability in where the pink dots are compared to the dark blue dots, as we can see here. There's similar variation in NICU um, beds per capita shown here on this side from uh, David Goodman. This is an old slide from the 1980s, although it's in 90s, which is actually very similar, where you have higher beds per patients um, in some communities than others, the higher numbers of beds per patient may be either because they're in a large area with a large number of academic centers, shown here as these dark blue areas around Philadelphia, Los Angeles, New York City, or you have NICUs that, pay, that hospitals have established without a lot of people who live there and deliver there, such as we see in the Mountain West area. 
but I point out that there's wide ranges in the number of beds per capita in, in the United States. And this impacts then the access patients have to neonatal care if they need it. Um, even within an area, you may have wide variations in the use of a level three NICU if you're a very preterm baby. Um, shown here on the side part of the slide, the percentage of high-risk fetuses born level three B, that's the old, old term for this, or higher NICU, um, sorry, I'm striking back, um, ranged from 16% in some regions to almost 100%. Again, showing wide variations in access to care. Um, and this access is even more pronounced in rural communities. This is a study that I did with Katie Cushmanil, who's one of the world's experts in rural maternity care at the University of Minnesota. And this shows the proportion of, of, of rural residing residents who delivered a either preterm infant, this is 36 weeks and below, or a multiple gestation infant. And all she did, divided the hospitals were, did you have a NICU at all? Not saying that you should have delivered that patient, but did you have any resuscitation, any um, ability to resuscitate or manage a sick baby versus those who didn't? That would be a level one hospital. I wanna point out that less than about 20% um, of these, um, uh, patients even had, uh, their, their closest hospital even had a NICU available. Those that did, about 60 to 70% delivered at such a hospital, compared to rural patients whose closest hospitals did not have a NICU. And for them, less than 40% delivered, a baby who should have delivered at a high-risk hospital, a uh, hospital with high-risk uh, capabilities, um, less than 40% did. Um, again, showing that access to care for these rural residing patients um, is much different than that for urban patients. So I'm going to go through here and come back to our study and ask the question, how do we then assess these changes that may have occurred with surface mining? And one of the challenges with surface mining is that you don't see changes just in pollution. But there's also a large economic change that may have occurred that either may benefit the communities, such as through changes in local economies or even leading to changes in healthcare. And then I point out that the only area in the United States with an expansion of obstetric services per capita since 2010 has actually been in North Dakota, where there's been a large influx of, of families of reproductive age um, surrounding the oil fields in the around the partial area, the partial oil fields in the center part of the state. Um, but they also may then have a pollution effect that also may be occurring with that. And how do you isolate the effects of surface mining from these concurrent changes? So I want people, and I'll probably spend about five or 10 minutes on this, know your data and know data what data are available and are not. Collect as much data on the drivers and these confounders that may that I've shown you that may influence the outcomes that you're studying in such a population-based approach. And then think about or get somebody who could be thinking about the appropriate methods that may allow you to really isolate the effect that you're trying to study in a larger set of data like what exists in many of these studies. So understand your data. I list here a large set of types of data, everything from patients where we prospectively collect the data all the way to um, claims, billing data and linked administrative data such as birth certificates that I use quite a bit. And the advantages and disadvantages going everything from accuracy of data and the ability to get complete information and the disadvantages of, of whom you're collecting data on, and do you have sufficient control groups to really be able to say something about um, what you're in your, your data set? And that's been challenged with some of the fracking data and the like, where the data have been very uh, narrowly focused around certain communities where you may not have the counterfactuals to really be able to study the impact of uh, here fracking on um, pregnancy outcomes. It's also important to collect the appropriate data. And this is a study from a fracking study that um, looked at the risk of birth defects in uh, pregnancies occurring in residents of 
mountaintop mining or surface mining counties in West Virginia, compare, which are in the blue, blue um, diamond uh, dots versus residents of non-mining communities, which are shown as the red or red square dots. And what they argued was that there's a variation in the reported risk of birth, uh, birth defects on the birth certificates, which is what all of these studies have done, um, looking at the association of surface mining on birth certificate risk. There is a variation by hospital in their reporting of the birth defects. That is, some hospitals, shown here on Hospital 22, have a much lower threshold to report them on the birth certificate compared to other hospitals in the state. And so they stratified the risk of birth certificates shown on the y-axis by hospital and by residential community. So on the left-hand side, you see overall residents of, of mountaintop mining counties in West Virginia had a higher risk of birth certificate of birth defects compared to non-residents. Shown here is this difference between the two um, dots on the left-hand side of the slide. But when you divide it by the six main hospitals in, that deliver babies in West Virginia, you find something very different. You find no statistical difference between residents of mountaintop mining counties versus those who don't. It just so happens that the one hospital that most of the patients who reside in mountaintop mining counties deliver at was also the hospital that reported the most birth certificates and uh, birth defects on the birth certificate. And you can see that when you look at the non-resident, non-mountaintop mining residents in West Virginia, at that hospital, they had six times the birth, birth defect rate as the hot patients who um, um, were going to one of the other five hospitals just pointing out that some of these stratification and other confounders may affect the results that you see in the, in the literature. Finally, I want to just point out that there are a variety of statistical methods that allow you to better understand um, and tease out the differences that you're interested in for given exposure, given other confounders that exist in your, in your um, data set, including propensity score methods, instruments, and matching studies. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on that. We can talk more or talk offline about these methods. Um, but the way I kind of think about propensity scores is that typically you're gonna do regression analyses, which uh, control for factors that are occurring in the case or control groups of any given um, cohort. Propensity scores attempts to isolate these patients for whom they have similar distributions of these covariates. Because if you don't have a similar patient, let's say that in this overlapping group, let's say you have a case group who has no risk factors compared that, um, I'm sorry, that we would find in the control group and vice versa, a regression model doesn't do a very good job of controlling for those differences. Um, they actually start to assume that the very rare patient with those factors that may not have had the outcome represent every patient who didn't have the outcome and you can get some wonky results. So propensity scores are a type of methodology um, that we can try to more, uh, more approximate a randomized study by finding patients in the case group or the exposed group and the control group who look similar in every other way and thus isolate those differences um, between um, cases and control that you're interested in studying. Um, the problem is that many times we can't measure those factors. They may either be unknown to your study design or not collected. And in this case, for example, we may have unmeasured patient factors. So for my studies, um, that either may be the fetal heart tracings or something of what's not known about how severe a, a pregnant patient's hypertension might be, which may impact both the likelihood you go to a high level center versus and may also impact outcomes. And so what we then tend to look at are variables that we can randomize the population without actually doing a randomized study. This is called an instrumental variable study. I put this slide up for the recording. I have a two hour lecture on this, but this is a method that you can use to randomize a study. Basically what you're doing is relying on a variable that exists, which, um, influences the treatment 
but is not associated with the outcome that you're concerned about, and thus the unmeasured variables that you may not um, know about in your study. For medical studies, many times it's distance. That's less of a good outcome for environmental studies, although it is something to, to ponder. Um, but for many studies, because people don't like to travel when sick, um, but they don't tend to live near a hospital because they think they're going to get sick, distance is actually a very good um, variable to randomize a population into those who are more likely to go to here a high level NICU versus a low level NICU. And we did that um, in our NICU study that I presented previously. The, pro the last thing that, you, that our group here at Penn has a lot of experience in, in is doing higher order matching studies where you actually physically try to match on 40 to 50 variables instead of the classic two or three that many studies have done using um, um, covariance matrices and some other high order computing techniques that you really then try to get groups that look extremely similar on a lot of different variables. And these methods have gotten to the point where you can exact match on certain factors that you feel like it's extremely important that the case and control that you've matched on are the same, race, gestational age, presence of hypertension, whatever you feel like is important, and then have the cases and controls otherwise look the same for a large number of variables, but the exact match may not be exactly the same. And a lot of the group um, that uh, the statistics groups at Penn have shown that these studies um, do improve your power and do allow you um, when you then um, ask the cases and controls to be far apart on a variable of interest to really allow you to hone in on the effect of that variable on an outcome that you're interested in studying. So these studies we did to make these hospitals that care for sick patients versus those who don't look similar in every other way, which in reality does not happen. Um, and that's what we found. So these state data here are in some cases three times larger in effect size than what studies that rely on re regression techniques have shown for the same, same type of, of, of intervention um, here delivery hospital um, in our work. So in conclusion, I want to point out to folks that there's a lot of different reasons that we find differences in outcomes for patients, children, pregnant patients, infants, newborns. Many of the environmental epi studies have casually accounted for these differences when they have done population-based studies. And it is important that you, um, that you account for those factors and look carefully in terms of how they may either um, confound your re result or may modify the effect that you observe um, in, um, in, a, in a study. And these include everything from healthcare, community, if you have a large enough data sets, even national policies or state level policies, as well as patient level factors. Um, and that if we don't account for these community factors, you run the risk of having policies or interventions that actually harm or fail to improve the health of our patients because what you thought you observed is not really the truth in reality. Um, here's my typical collaborator slide. Um, I think I went a little bit longer than I wanted to, but I'm happy to take any comments or um, um, questions that you might have. Sobering. Um, I always learn something when I hear you talk. And it's so easy to do mouse studies compared to these human studies. So since so many of the studies that we use, I'm just going to make it you know, more personal in terms of a lot of the studies that we in my lab use to inform our studies of, of why we want to do and provide the rationale for what we're doing for looking at exposures to animals. How, you know, we, we're just left with trying to figure out what is a really good study and, and, and obviously looking at all the factors that you mentioned, but since so many of them don't do that, um, and you can, you know, it's easy for many of us to, to just dismiss those. But what about, about the ones that are kind of gray? And, and are there ways that we can look at these already published studies to say, okay, well, you matched for 30 of these variables, which nobody does in these no, studies, nobody. Um, I won't say nobody, I would say hardly anybody. Uh, you know, I, I guess 
what would be some of the key variables that you think would be critically important? And now I know it, it, it uh, it's about it, outcomes in terms of if you're looking at preterm birth and, you know, or you're looking at, you know, whatever your disease is, but are there some global kinds of factors that, that most people don't include in their epi studies that we should be looking for? It's kind of a hard question. But so, <laughs> so I think I would answer that question, Becky, by saying, I think it's twofold. One is you need to know your outcome and you need to know your exposure. So what is your exposure? What is its typical distribution? Because I will say mm -hmm. that from what I've observed, and correct me if I'm wrong, from folks who've forgotten more about environmental epi than I know, there are the studies where there is like air pollution. Mm -hmm. That's a kind of a classic one in perinatal epi where air pollution is so correlated with a lot of other factors that also have been associated with bad outcomes yeah. or that the outcomes. And I think you really need to study these things carefully and make sure that you know what people have accounted for. Now that may be different than let's say phthalate exposure. I was on study section for two years and I must have read 15 <laughs> grants about phthalates. I knew, I now know more about that than I ever thought I wanted to know. <laughs> And you know maybe there, there's a much more narrowly defined exposure, but I would argue that even those narrow defined exposures, there are factors about patients who are likely to be exposed. You need to have thought about that. Yeah. And yeah. then you have to evaluate the, the papers, just like a systematic review and decide mm -hmm. if you believe the data or the data flawed. The study that I, I showed from that meta, the systematic review, was one of the meta-analysis, a mm -hmm. systematic review, came away with the conclusion that the surface mining literature was so flawed that there is no recommendation they can make on the outcomes. Yeah, do you know the problem with that is that, you know, we, we know that there are lots of exposures that are, are will lead to bad outcomes. So I'll just use BPA for an example. And, and you know, we got, not me, but the, in, the field got such pushback from industry saying, oh, the, all these studies are flawed, 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 which they were. And so until more and more and more animal studies were done, they refused to, you know, change the regulations, but right. at least taking that approach. But anyhow, I, I see that Arnold has his hand up. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of comments. One is I never saw the data uh, in your slides for the Latino patients. For, for which study? Because I, I, I threw through about... 10 years worth of work and about an hour. So Latino patients, there is, um, what's interesting is that, so are you referring to the Hispanic paradox or that we've got data suggesting we don't have such a paradox anymore? Oh, I've just written an article on it. So that's- So what do, you, what do you, yeah, so I'd love to know what you're talking. So, you know, there is this idea that birth weight and, and preterm birth risk in Hispanic patients is lower for a similar sociodemographic group um, income and, and where patients live than others. Um, and what's interesting is that more recent data and Diana Montoya Williams is spearheaded that group from our, from my group lab group um, is showing that at least that paradox is narrowing if not being eliminated. Um, and the question is, is it, is it community factors? Is it differences? and who's emigrating, who you're studying, and what their like kind of lifelong risk and even trans uh, generational risk might be. I don't know what you found, but that's at least what she has um, started to see with uh, some of her work from using birth certificates. Well, we cited a, a, an epidemiologic study that did not show it disappearing, that in fact, it's been very durable over the course of 20 years, but, uh, that's going to be published in uh, the Journal of Internal Medicine in Europe. Cool. Absolutely. It's interesting to say that because I think it's a difficult question to try to try to to get at because I think there is starting to be some kind of in both camps. And I think it is important that it's like who's studying it, how well, because again, I think what we have started to look at is Hispanic obviously is not a homogenous population and that um, 
There are definitely differences in outcomes, particularly in the Puerto Rican and Dominican populations, which are much worse, mm -hmm. let's say the Cuban and South and Central American populations. All right, 62% are Mexican American in the United States. In the United States, yes. And they're almost all in California, no, California and Texas. In that, like California, it's, for California, 43% of the births are Mexican. I mean, it's, it is a massive, California has 470,000 births a year, just to give people a context. If I can share a map, I, selenium is, in, in the small quantities, is, is essential for the enzymes related to glutathione, which are the enzymes that protect against toxins. So uh, I came across it uh, when I was looking at why Finland has such a high dementia rate, hmm. and they had soil very deficient in selenium hmm. to the extent that the, the country actually added it to the fertilizer. Interesting. But the problem revealing the other side of the coin is that too much selenium is neurotoxic. Yep. So uh, it's, this is just another possible confounding factor as you look across the nation. Yes, and I think that's the, the other piece. Um, I, I remember we were talking about doing a grant on surface mining, and it's like we came up with like 45,000 co covariates we had to think about. <laughs> and this is what happens when you have epi people doing this, and, and, and I agree with that. But I do think it, it, I mean, like you say, there's there are, and I think it's just understanding what those drivers are and, and, and how important it might be to um, include them in whatever study you're trying to, to consider.